Good evening, everyone. In accordance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, be advised that a notice of this meeting was made by posting on the bulletin board in town hall and forwarding, forwarding to the officially designated newspapers that this meeting would take place at town hall at 7 p.m. Tuesday, March 19th, 2024. Meeting details and the draft agenda were also posted on our township website. Please stand to salute the flag. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Collins? Here. Mr. Purvis? Here. Deputy Mayor Sacramento? Present. Mr. Stoller? Present. Mayor Romano? Here. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the March 5th, 2024 regular township committee minutes? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? No. May I have a motion to approve the March 5th, 2024 special township committee minutes? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, reports. I am going to go first. <laughs> Uh, Create Senior Citizen Advisory Board uh, met last week. The Creative Hands ladies received a thank you note from the Depart Department of Veteran Affairs uh, just today, I believe, thanking them for the donation of baby items. They donated hats, sweaters, and blankets. They will be given to the Women's Veterans Program at a baby shower that's going to be thrown for them in uh, June. Just a reminder, the senior bus is available four days a week. You can sign up. Uh, the phone number is on the township website under the Senior Citizen Department. It's a free service for residents over 62 years of age, and it, trans it uh, travels throughout the township. The Friday Friends have an upcoming fire safety and smoke alarms seminar and previously had a speaker on Medicare fraud. So all the trips and offerings and all the information is on the township website on the senior citizen page. And you can also sign up to receive the newsletter either in paper form or digital. Flood mitigation, I attended a meeting for the first time last week. It's a great group of people that work very hard. It's a lot of planning going on within surrounding towns and community and count and the county. So I look forward to working with Committeeman Stoller on that and Mr. McDonald with the, the other municipalities and reaching out to the county. Uh, the Wyoming Avenue crosswalks. I wanna uh, thank those residents that brought that up at the last meeting. Our liaison, uh, Mr. Camacho was on the phone the next morning with the, our business administrator and the county engineer. And they're gonna be working on installing and in painting and painting crosswalks at those uh, intersections on Wyoming Avenue. So great things happening when everybody works together. And those are my reports. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Sure. Um, so the Environmental Commission met um, and they're exploring a potential resolution recommending the banning of bamboo and other invasive species. They're also looking into making recommendations for banning gas powered leaf blowers. So those are uh, more long-term projects that they're working on. Um, and then finally, the EC put forth a resolution uh, asking the township to add a referendum item on November's ballot for the uh, open space trust fund. And that's gonna be discussed a little later tonight. Um, the planning board uh, unanimously voted that the ordinance revoking the redevelopment plan for nine Main Street was not inconsistent with the master plan. Um, so I know that that terminology may seem um, a little difficult, not inconsistent with the master plan. That's basically them saying they approve of it and it goes back to the TC. Uh, and we will be addressing that later tonight. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission uh, met and unanimously passed a resolution recommending that the TC directly designate the Short Hills Village as a historical district. The first read of the ordinance that will enact this designation is on the agenda for later in this meeting. Um, also, the chair of the HPC sent a letter out to the Marywood Nottingham residents announcing that the proposed designation process that started last fall 
will be removed from the table because it was previously tabled, so sort of suspended. Mm -hmm. So it'll be unsuspended, and then they're going to officially end that process uh, for those designations. So they should hopefully provide comfort to the residents of Marywood Nottingham that the HPC is no longer pursuing uh, that district. Um, those are my reports. Thank you. Could we get <clears throat> Sure. Thank you. Uh, Recreation Committee. Uh, Township President Bob Gula presented to the Rec Committee on Wednesday. He has a proposal to add a map kiosk near one of the entrances to Taylor Park commemorating the Forgotten Victory Trail, which passed through Milburn during the American Revolutionary War. Maybe something for the HPC. Uh, also, uh, just to residents, all get your pool, golf, tennis, pickleball memberships. The part three opens on April 1st, so right around the corner. Uh, from the SID, uh, Milburn Short Hills Restaurant Week, uh, started on March 17th and goes through March 23rd. Over 40 restaurants and bakeries are participating. Uh, I've uh, eaten out twice so far, so I work on day two. So uh, it's fantastic you know, uh, deals out there. Uh, we're having a webinar for New Jersey businesses. Uh, starts at 8.30 on Friday uh, to RSVP. Uh, you can uh, email Steve Grillo. Uh, and then it's the last chance to submit promos for the Metropolitan, uh, which is opening. Uh, it's the last week to provide content and postcards uh, to, to, due to the Explorer's office, uh, trying to get everything uh, put in place. Nothing to report on the joint fields right now. Uh, nothing to report on the dispatch. Uh, Mayor Romano discussed the uh, flood mitigation. Uh, and a big thank you to everyone on that committee, uh, just doing fantastic work. A lot of big things to come. Uh, and then a big congratulations also to Mayor Romano. She was honored by the Essex County Township uh, for uh, Women's uh, History Month. So congratulations. Thank you. Committee Men Cole. <clears throat> yeah, um, <clears throat> the Arboretum uh, had their monthly meeting and uh, Jorge Mastro Pietro was elected to the Board of Trustees. Um, and we also discussed the uh, historic preservation ordinance that Frank just mentioned, as the Arboretum is part of that district. Um, it is it's township owned land, but of course uh, they, uh, they're they part of the district and they were in uh, unanimous support of the designation. Um, as a library, um, just let everybody know that the book drop that um, had been uh, taken out of service after the car accident has been reinstalled. And the, the library trustees wish to thank the DPW for its putting that um, in place so quickly. So that's back uh, and usable. Um, and then it's time to start getting ready for the book sale. It's, an, and it's a huge event. Um, it's, the collections will be starting in early April. And if you have uh, books that uh, you no longer want to keep in your house, that uh, it's a huge fundraiser for the library. And I would also encourage you to attend the book sale if you want to add to your collection. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee Woman Prupas. Thank you. Next Wednesday, the March 27th at 8 p.m. in this room is the Downtown Circulation Improvement Meeting where the um, concept plan for two-way on Essex Street will be discussed. So please come out. And there's also a Zoom option. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, yes, just a few brief reports. Um, just a reminder that uh, the budget uh, will be forthcoming for introduction to the Township Committee on April 2nd, uh, after which we will have a budget information session, not the week of spring break, um, in between uh, the introduction and uh, adoption, which is scheduled for the first May meeting. I uh, just wanted to provide some information to the public and to the committee that the fire department is the uh, proud recipient of a $75,000 grant for um, uh, PPE or turnout gear. Uh, the police department has also applied for a grant for distracted driving. Uh, and the rec department is currently in the process of applying for a grant for uh, additional Taylor Park lighting. Um, so while well, we're continuing our activities to find grant money and uh, grant opportunities, doesn't mean that we don't necessarily get them all, but uh, but happy to report that the fire department got another firefighter assistance grant uh, for seventy five thousand dollars. 
Um, just to those uh, neighborhoods that have been impacted uh, by uh, quite a bit of PSEG work, um, we have met with PSEG and we went through the paving plan for uh, this spring, and we are uh, pleased to report that we are, um, in in particular in the Washington section, going to be able to get uh, between the township's efforts and PSEG's efforts, uh, all of the roads that were impacted uh, paved curb to curb. Um, so, uh, the only street that is left out of that, uh, is Meeker because there was no work done on Meeker. Uh, but, uh, but Blaine Church, Rector's, Taylor, Spring, Willow, um, Mechanic, Ocean, Orchard will all be paved, uh, curb to curb. Uh, in addition to Glenwood section, um, will also be addressed, uh, from the impacts of, uh, PSE and G. Um, we are, um, we're currently working through that, but Pine, Pine Terrace East, Pine Terrace West, um, uh, Wellington, you know, and, and various streets over there are also going to be paved curb to curb. Our goal is continuing to get uh, curb to curb through uh, credits that the township has done through its paving process um, so that that PSEAG can uh, pave a road curb to curb. Um, Beechcroft area that is currently being worked on and nearly complete, uh, that will be later, later on um, in the spring uh, so they can have time for the trenches to settle. Uh, just a update on the Fairfield uh, Drive issue um, with regard to the paving project that was um, uh, halted up there as a result of an underground conduit uh, in the roadway that is uh, too shallow for us to perform milling. Uh, we have been in consistent contact with JCPNL since November, uh, trying to uh, get them to go out and address the issue. Uh, I'm happy to report that UtiliQuest, the company that will be doing the measurement of the depth of that conduit to ensure that it is either at a, is at a safe depth or whether work needs to be done to create it, uh, put it at a, uh, at a new depth uh, and a safe depth uh, is, is forthcoming. They've they finally uh, gotten a contract with UtiliQuest and, and are scheduling that work. So uh, that is also forthcoming. Thank you. Mr. Cantor. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Um, the only update I have is I know some people have been following the filings on our fair share housing uh, litigation. Um, the current return date for the motions um, is March 28th. It has not been officially adjourned yet, but I did get a call from the court today, and it looks like it will be rescheduled for either April 8th or April 9th, uh, with April 9th probably being the preference. Um, it's not official yet. I know a lot of you follow the docket. Uh, once it's official, we'll make that announcement. Um, but it looks like there will be an adjournment of that date based on fair share houses request of, of an adjournment of that date. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, um, so now I'd like to introduce Priya Patel uh, from the Environmental Commission, who will be presenting this evening on the proposed open state open space tax referendum to bring to the voters. Great. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for allowing us the opportunity to present to you about open space. Um, I'm just going to run through some slides as quickly as I can just to give you an overview of what we are talking about here. So um, conserving open space, managing growth through local financing. So next slide, Tim. The real question that we're trying to answer is how can we protect the open space that we currently have in town and also create more wherever possible? So that kind of leads to the question, well, what is open space? So many of us know what it is sort of um, figuratively, it's open land, um, but definitively it's undeveloped or it can be undeveloped property. It can be privately owned, publicly owned, um, it could be somewhat improved or partially developed. Um, it can be underutilized and they're purchased and then developed um, and preserved into open space. And in New Jersey, sports fields, like um, are the ones that we use, um, by, that are used by our rec department are also considered open space. So some examples of open space in our town are obviously South Mountain Reservation, Taylor Park, um, Old Short Hills Park, um, the Fox Hill Preserve, which is up in Deerfield section and, and often um, called the Oakey Tract. And why open space matters. I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory, but um, you know, I think it, it certainly enhances the beauty of our town, um, provides recreational opportunities, 
reduces noise and air pollution, and it gives water a place to go. We obviously have a lot of experience with catastrophic flooding in this town and open space al allows water to, to dr drain properly and not flood our streets and internal drains. We conducted some surveying earlier this year, I believe it was, and we found um, that people in our town really love open space. They're very heavy users of it. Um, they want more and they prioritize certain things such as you know more amenities, they want safety, so perhaps more lighting. And they also voiced an interest in protecting the, the water and the natural resources that are in our town. So a way to pay for open space is through local financing. And local financing can take the form of a bond or dedicated tax. Um, and past decades, many local governments around the state have adopted measures to, um, to locally finance open space through um, ballot measures. And that's what we're talking about today is actually putting a question on the ballot this upcoming November that would basically create a fund for open space. Um, you can see by the numbers that it's a pretty popular um, mechanism, 440 and counting out of the 562 state, county, municipal questions, 80% um, have been passed in the last 30 years. So the fund can be used to buy property that's for sale or to convert it to open space. We could also use the fund to, um, to accept donations from individuals that are you know, moving on from the township and are looking to um, sell their property and then they could sell it to the, the township um, you know, for fair market value and then we could convert it into a pocket park. Um, it can also be used to maintain what is currently open space and sort of the downstream effect of it would be to address some the problem somewhat of overdevelopment by taking basically this land that could be sold to a developer and purchasing it and preserving it as open space. So the benefits again, I think are pretty, um, you know, self-explanatory, but certainly one use could be to convert unused lots into green space, restore forest meadows and woodlands in our town, which would then increase biodiversity, which would mitigate flooding, um, combat heat island effect, increase our climate resilience as a municipality, and also fund parks and rec fields, which many people have expressed in a real need for. And one thing I forgot to mention was that open space funding in New Jersey can also be used to preserve, preserve historical sites. So the benefits, local funding is really the foundation of any long-term conservation effect effort. And we see this across the state and you know, and the, and the reasons are, are many, but primarily because external funding, you know, oftentimes requires an upfront match. And, you know, external funding can also be hard to procure. It can be unreliable. You know, it may be available one year, but then may not be the next year. So, you know, local financing is, as you would think, local, it's hyper-local. We, the residents dictate the priorities. So it's, it really affords us a level of autonomy. So how is it funded? Um, essentially, it would involve levying an additional tax per $100 of assessed property value. All 21 counties in New Jersey have a tax, and they range from anywhere between um, 0.025 cents per $100 in Bergen, all the way up to six cents in Warren. And so these are some of the towns in Essex County that have one. You can see that they all kind of fall in the range of one cent. And then Madison, which is obviously not in Essex, it's in Morris, but I wanted to give an example of some comparable towns. Madison has a two cent tax and New Prov has a one cent tax and New Providence is in Union County. So we've talked to other towns um, and they, are very happy with 
the results, um, they're able to convert, you know, unused property into beautiful gardens. They're able to pay for um, playground upgrades um, and maintain open space. And every town, again, because it's very, very local, um, they're really able to dictate what their priorities are. So if the town priorities are um, maintaining, you know, more grassy, grassy areas, creating pocket parks, then that's how the money can be used. If the priority is on, um, you know, recreational fields, then that's how the money can be used. So to give you a sense of what the steps would be, first, the Environmental Commission would draft and pass a resolution, which is what we did at our, at our last meeting. And we passed a, a unanimously passed a resolution for one cent. Then we introduced the resolution for a ballot measure to all of you, and that's what we're doing this evening. And as you can see, we passed it on January 23rd, mm -hmm. and it was for a one cent tax. The ballot mm -hmm. measure would be for this upcoming November election. And just to give you a sense of how the math works, um, again, there, that's an error in the slide. Um, it shouldn't be two cents, it's actually one cent. So for example, if a home is assessed at $1 million, a resident would pay, and that's incorrect, would be paying $100 annually. And this is what it would look like. You've seen this on a ballot um, for our school bonds. It would just go as a question in the corner and that would be the wording. And this is just an example from Point Pleasant. So if, the, if you all approve the resolution, then it would be submitted to the county to be put on the ballot. And the deadline for that is mid-July. And then between now and the November election, the Environmental Commission, us, along with the Rec Department and other um, stakeholders would engage in a very intensive public outreach and education campaign so that residents are informed, they know exactly what this is about. Um, we would hold information sessions at the library, at the schools, um, obviously push out as much information as possible via social media and print and broadcast, um, and just make sure that everyone is as informed as possible. And then, you know, the last step would obviously be to vote. So after November, if the measure is passed, the next step would then be for all of you to pass an ordinance, which would establish this fund. And that ordinance would clearly state what can and cannot be funded by this um, trust fund and also would be, could dictate terms. So for instance, there are some towns that indicate a sunset, like after five years, the fund will shut down. Um, you know, that's entirely up to all of you. So this is just really the time frame, a nutshell. So January, we introduced the resolution. We're here now in March. Um, our clerk would then submit the measure <coughs> to the county. And then over the summer, really, is when we would do the, the really um, the hard work of educating our township. And November, they get to vote, yes or no. So just to give you a sense of revenue, potential revenue, um, the average assessed value of class two, that's residential properties is 1.3 million. And with a one cent tax, that would raise $128 roughly per household times the number of those properties. So we would get, be able to raise about 800,000 a year for open space. And some eligible projects. This is just from talking to um, folks that work for REC and um, historical preservation, um, forest restoration at the Arboretum. Um, apparently, many trees, I think 80% of their beech trees are being impacted by beech leaf disease. So, this could potentially fund forest restoration there. Um, purchasing or leasing of new fields for sports and recreation, lighting of existing fields or lighting of Taylor Park. I think that was mentioned earlier. 
new community center at Giro Park. Some of these things are, you know, on the rec department's wish list. Parcel house rehabilitation and the Short Hills train station rehabilitation. Another eligible project could be preserving the 32 acre Oki tract as a mini forest with trails or um, potentially converting 132 Milburn Ave, which is the former Exxon station, um, right on the corner of Box Hall and Milburn and turning that into a pocket park. So you can see there's like at the upper right corner is what it looks like right now, which is kind of a hideous eyesore. And, and somebody kind of created a collage for me that would turn it into a, like a, a site that would commemorate the Battle of Springfield um, with this, you know, with some seating along the river. So that's potentially something that could be funded by this project, I mean, by this fund. So I wanted to just throw out the big picture opportunity. So we have about 119 acres of class um, one vacant land, and we have um, about 480 acres of class 15. So that's publicly and privately owned vacant land. So in total, 600 acres of open space are in our town right now. And, you know, the fund could potentially be used towards purchasing those acres and converting them into open space, giving water somewhere to go, reducing the flooding in our town, proving water quality, and in, in general, enhancing the quality of life in town. So the question today is really about the ballot measure. And we really believe that this ballot measure would give, would give voters a direct opportunity to weigh in on this issue of open space. And you know, obviously it's a, an extremely powerful way for voters to, you know, to, to really express, you know, what came out in the survey, which is that open space is a huge priority. Um, overdevelopment is a huge concern. And we believe the trust fund could address both of those priorities in our town. So that's really it. Um, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, Renee and I can answer them. Thank you. Thank you yes, so much. Of course. I agree. Committee members have any questions or comments? Committee question. Cohen. So on your slide <clears throat> where yes. you had that estimate, you looked at residential property, but commercial would, wouldn't commercial property also then be taxed? So the number would be the annual number that you have that's much lower and it would actually be even a lot more when you when you add in all the commercial property. Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. So I had a question. Um, are there matching county funds that are potentially available uh, to us, um, you know, for projects that we do with the funds that would be established by this reserve? And if there are, is that something we can only get if we have an open space? Uh, I believe, tax? yes. Now, I know for sure that there are state funds available through the Green Acres program that 100 percent, yes, um, we in fact, one of the criteria for accessing that money is to have a local funding mechanism. They wanna make sure that a municipality has skin in the game. So the only way you can access that, that money is by having a trust fund. And that's why half of Essex County towns do have this because they know it's the way for them to get these state dollars. Regarding the county money, I believe that's also true, but I'm not 100% certain, um, but we can find that find out for you. Yes, we're basically at a disadvantage if we don't have this tax in place because there's potential sources of outside funding that we're not able to take advantage of. And it certainly seems like for most households, it's going to be a very small fee. And it sounds like it could go a long way towards combating overdevelopment and also addressing recreation fields, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, Deputy Mayor um, Sakamani, I, that's been brought up many times before. I gave this similar presentation two years ago, and that was brought up by other folks um, on the committee who said, you know, it's, it's money that we're leaving on the table and other towns are being able to access it. So, you know, if we could, if we could set up this fund and we get to control it, it's a local fund. We set up a, um, a committee and there's very direct oversight by the elected officials and by stakeholders. Um, so, it's, it's, yeah, I, I, that's really why we are strong advocates for it. 
And if it, you know, after a certain amount of time, five years, 10 years, forever, you know, you guys decided, you know what, maybe we don't need this anymore. We built up enough of a reserve. Is it something that has to continue in perpetuity or can it be assessed? No, not at all. In fact, um, I don't know the exact number of the towns that have a sunset period of three years or five years, but um, some, absolutely, it's, it's, the terms of the fund are controlled by the elected officials. So again, once November comes around, if we get to the point where it gets on the ballot and people weigh in and everyone weighs in on the yes side, then it's really up to all of you to create those terms for this fund. Um, and just like any other commission or local government body, which is comprising stakeholders, um, folks from town hall, you know, everyone gets to weigh in and it's it's done all sort of in the, the light of day. <laughs> great. Yeah. Sounds great. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, sure. So it also gives us significant autonomy and flexibility in, in the, and also being able to move very nimbly when the opportunities arise. Uh, so for the builds and the other sporting activities and uh, things like this, there's no ambiguity. We can use it for sporting fields and rec fields and things along those uh, those absolutely lines as well. yeah i mean i know that renee and i as members of the environmental commission would prefer pollinator gardens and <laughs> forests and you know and all of that all the birds and fairies but um there are there are there are definite priorities in this town um we need rec fields as many people have expressed so yes absolutely in the state of new jersey rec fields count as open space and similarly um, historical preservation um, the money can be used for historical preservation right, right, good. Yeah. And, and, and obviously you know given the water situation we have having somewhere to go it's you know very top of list right now in terms of uh, uh reducing flooding so it's you know we're going yeah. through a lot of measures there. Um, you know, I, Sean Klein, the mayor in Livingston, did you have a chance to sit with him and understand how he's used, utilizing uh, the uh, open space tax? Honestly, I haven't spoken to him about this in at least a year, yeah. um, but he was a very strong advocate for this. Um, the reality is, is that New Jersey is the most paved over state in the country. So you know, we need more open space for the water to go somewhere. Yeah. And Livingston has done a really great job of creating those open spaces to address, you know, certainly the, the concerns of the community and the needs um, for recreation, but also to help with Yeah, I'd certainly be willing to set that meeting up with you and Renee if you'd like to have that, because they've done fantastic yeah. things with that open space tax. Uh, also, uh, you know, what Frank was mentioning uh, with Essex County mm -hmm. tax, and we pay a lot of money to Essex County. We're the first or second largest taxpayer in Essex County. Mm -hmm. So we should definitely be participating and not leaving, uh, you know, we get very little back in return. Yes. So if we're leaving any monies on the table, we should be uh, matching, receiving back, et cetera, participating in any open space funds matching that they have. Yeah. So. I'm not I know they did. <laughs> yeah, Livingston acquired a few properties using their open space fund uh, that really has benefited the community by keeping it green and providing, you know, green space uh, for Livingston. And they did it through this this money and this, this the raising of this money. I think at the tax up this two percent for Livingston. Yeah, uh, I think it might be three. Was, yeah. Now, Jared, the more land that we designate as open space, does that help us in the vacant land analysis when it's time to compute fair share numbers? Uh, well, it gets put on the Rossi potentially, but that's a whole process. So the answer is, 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 is it's unclear. Okay. Priya, I just want to thank you for all your hard work on this presentation. I know that we've been discussing this for a long time <laughs> and I, I think it's going to pass at least to get on the referendum. So it's really exciting. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. I Persevering. Know. Yes. Staying <laughs> and giving yeah. up. You were one of the original advocates. So I, I do appreciate your support. Thank you. I just want to add to that there's already up on the Environmental Commission's yes. pages on the township's website, you can click on Open Space Trust Fund, and it will give you an overview, everybody who's listening out there, um, about what 
what this is all about and what the parameters are. So right. you can get your questions ready for all of the coming info sessions that will be held. Yes. yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Not yet. The slide deck is not out there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. right. Thank, Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Public comment. When invited to speak to offer your comments, please come to the lectern, clearly state your name and whether you were a Milburn resident and or property or business owner. Please do not provide your full address seeing our meetings are recorded and are readily available to the public. For the convenience of our community, there is a remote option. If you call in and would like to comment, please press star six now. If you are attending by computer or, or electronic device, please click the raise hand button and be sure your video is on when you comment. All members of the public wishing to speak will be put into the queue to address the committee. To help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers shall limit their comments to one three minute session. You will be prompted when there is 30 seconds remaining. A reminder, this is not a time for dialogue or to debate a matter, and this is time during our business meeting for the public, public to offer comments. I will now open the public comments period. Carol Kirsch, uh, Wyoming resident, and I wanted to thank you all on the committee and the county for the amazingly rapid response to our request to address the Wyoming Avenue situation. While thinking about crosswalks, I had some additional thought which I would like to add. While a motorist stopping for a pedestrian while they are navigating a crosswalk may seem to be common sense, it certainly appears that many motorists are likely not even aware that the state revised its crosswalk law in 2010, which now requires drivers to come to a stop for pedestrians in a crosswalk and remain stopped until they are one lane away, as well as an awareness of the fine imposed for failing to do so. While there may be some who would choose to ignore this, I firmly believe that the vast majority of motorists and pedestrians may very well be ignorant of the law and its penalties, as there does not appear to be any established or at least effective communication avenue that would update already licensed drivers or pedestrians to new state laws as they become effective. This being the case, I would like to urge that as the county puts in these much needed crosswalks on Wyoming Avenue, that they also put signage alerting motorists to the requirements of the law and the implications for not following it. Um, I have information that the county put out, including a nice picture of what could be a sign. So I wanted to just give an And actually, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Leah Cruz, resident. Um, I hope nobody throws tomatoes at me, but I'm against banning gas powered um, leaf blowers at this time. Um, to me, <laughs> I don't really know many people who do their own lawns. And it feels like a little bit of an elitist attitude to say, well, we're going to force these um, hardworking landscapers to change and buy new equipment. I could be convinced otherwise, so I'm hoping tonight there'll be some discussion about um, what other towns have done, because I know other towns have banned them, and I wonder how it has worked out. So um, I hope somebody can answer that question at some point tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Renee Paparian. I'm a resident. I would like to answer Leah's question, even though I know I'm supposed to be addressing you. That's a no, no. I invite you, everyone here and everyone in the township, to come to an environmental commission meeting that is scheduled for April 11th, seven o'clock, April 11th, correct? I believe so, seven o'clock right here in this room where there will be a presentation all about banning gas powered leaf blowers. So we will try to advertise this again, but Leah, please attend. I'll be away, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Antonio Braca, Melbourne resident. Um, the gas leaf blower thing was new to me. Uh, I didn't realize we were going the way Maplewood went. Um, I have plenty of friends that are landscapers that are 
they're 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 affected by it because they cannot raise their prices due to the fact that it takes twice as long to clean the properties without the gas powered leaf blowers. It's not really what's the difference between running a lawnmower or a gas blower. I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's just nonsense. Uh, uh, number two is uh, the um, the revival of the Main Street closure, possibly this year. Um, again, I think it's nonsense. I don't think it needs to be done. I don't think that there's any reason that they need to take that space away from traffic. I, I think it hurts the local business owners more than it helps. Um, I feel like it's cattle in a pen and I feel like there's no reason for it to be closed on Monday afternoon. Every restaurant closes one day a week. There, Anything can happen on any day that that could hinder somebody being well or not well. Um, so uh, again, I just I, I just don't understand why that's coming up again. I understand people want music and people want chalk art and people want this and that and whatever. There's a 13 acre park right next to it where all the music and all the chalk art and all the programs and all the yoga and all the whatever else people want to do here can do in the park. I just don't understand why that main vein section needs to be closed for 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, 70 days, whatever it may be. So that's, that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Susan Vallis, I'm a resident in town. I have to second what Anthony brought up. Talking about closing Main Street. Are we doing this again? Have we not learned from last year's incident what happened? Or, or are we going to wait for somebody to die this time? It just it really irritates me that you guys are thinking of closing Main Street again. It's a main artery to a hospital. We need to get to a hospital. If you live south of Milburn Avenue, you live in Springfield, you're, you could be dead by the time you get to the hospital, diverting around this town and the congestion in it. It does not need to be closed. Go to the park, have your dinners at the park, have the parking lot. You got the parking lot over there by, uh, on Ess off of Essex Street in Maine. There's a big parking lot. Pergola uses it. Karami uses it. Why do you have to close down Main Street, a main artery to a hospital? Because you know what? Doing that, somebody's main artery is going to close in their body. It's ridiculous. I don't know what we haven't learned from last year. You know, my husband almost died last year trying to get to the hospital on June 30th. He almost died. Next time, somebody might. And this town will be stuck with some lawsuit over that because it's senseless, it's pointless, it's dumb. Okay? I don't know, really, if who's getting paid off for this. But to close it down, what businesses are wanting this? You can't go and serve on the sidewalk. You're doing it now. It, it wasn't. It, we're not in COVID anymore. Don't close Main Street because somebody is going to literally die one day. We, we've come close to it last year. And I'm telling you, you're waiting for a lawsuit and you, the town's going to suffer. The town is going to suffer and it should suffer if somebody dies because they can't get to a hospital in time. I talked to you in the park. I talked to you, Ben, in the park one time. I talked to another gentleman. They all agreed. That's why I'm here, because closing it is just ridiculous. And you should really think twice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Kirsch, Melbourne resident. Um, I was really very excited hearing uh, Ms. Patel's presentation. I was thinking um, 
you know, we're really fortunate to have, we've got a big bucket in this township of, of, of residence values and property values. And it's one of the reasons to keep our, our tax rate so low. And I think we can use it. You know, if my math is right, this fund, the way it's presented, one cent on $100 is going to be one ten thousandth of assessed value of properties, which is pretty dramatic. I mean, dramatically low. I think people hearing that fraction, you know, would it would help them to support it. Um, I think it's a tremendous tool for the town to have. We're lucky to have this much value in here. Um, we're, we're giving up an amount that I know for, for myself, my property, we're, we're never going to miss it. And it's going to be the power of numbers to, I'm, I'm amazed at the number that can be raised the first year, and that's without um, commercial properties. Um, and I can't wait for the town to make plans and start using the money. It just gives us control. I know West Orange has a group that's trying to preserve a forest up there for this flood control, the same thing. And I guess if they had the funds, they would probably go ahead and buy it. And it's going to be crucial for flood control. Um, and thinking of the property that was mentioned on the corner of uh, Box Hall and Milburn Avenue, we're by there all the time. And, you know, there's always a water problem down there. So to take one small example, if that was deconstructed and could absorb some of the water that overflows, you just would not have water in the streets, you know, down on Box Hall like you do. Plus that tremendous eyesore that's been there for 10 years or so would, would be gone. So I just, I'm very excited about the possibilities for this. I think the one thing that will be important is uh, assuming this goes through, and I think it will, is to have um, some kind of um, group that represents the township and the residents to see what to do with this money. Because I can see right away, there's gonna be all, people are gonna have all kinds of ideas. Some people are gonna prefer recreational things, some people lighting, some people more natural types of things or, or flood control. So I think that's down the road, but I, I just think it's a fantastic idea and I'm glad that we finally got to it. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie Dwyer, Short Hills resident. Mm -hmm. I think the open um, space fund is a great idea. I think it raises a lot of questions though, as far as mechanism, because we're talking about a tax. And if it's been report, I saw a report today that's saying that gas tax in New Jersey is going to go up by about two cents. So. What happens when you say tax? It changes the whole mindset. All of a sudden, my costs are going up. If you include commercial in that, that's going to be passed along to the consumer. Costs are going to go up. I think it, you have to look and think about what should be the mechanism to get the funding. A thought could be on transfer of property. So in a sale of a property, put a, put a fee on that, 1%. Buyer pays that off to the fund. If the if my numbers are about right, I think in 2023 there was about 127 million in residential property transfers, purchases of properties. Take one percent of that; it's 1.2, almost 1.3 million dollars right there in one year. So if you and you can do that on and on, it's a great way of doing it. A lot of places do that. Massachusetts they do it. They get a lot of money. They're able to do exactly what you're going to do. I think you've got to think about that before you vote on this. What's that real mechanism you really want to put in place? And then also questions will come up about how does this get administered? As the gentleman before me said, you know, how are you going to govern this? How are you going to put the body together to really oversee it? Because you know what? What people would think, put politicians in charge, we, we could end up in a bad spot. Mm. No offense to anybody at the, at the dance. But think about it, the writing, how this is written before you vote on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Jeffrey Feld, a longtime resident of the poet section. Um, most of my comments now are going to be based on the agenda. But first, I want to go back to a comment that I made about September 2020, especially in light of the you know, litigation. I make my call for like a public library of the pleadings. I think the community needs to see the pleadings that have been filed. They should be posted on the public website. Also, I think the, the township and the council committee members need to see the Main Street, New Jersey application that was filed last week. And everyone could draw their own conclusions from that. As to the agenda, the bill list, when you look at the attorney's requisitions, at the February meeting, you paid his January retainer. When I made the open request, there was no backup. This 
On this bill list, there's payments listing requisitions for work that's done. Are we getting a $6,000 credit like we did um, with Marizidi Falcon? I don't know that. Also, on this bill list, the payment to defending the fair share housing litigation is coming from general funds. In February, it came out of the trust account and the judge made that uh, an issue. There's a payment that we're paying for the SID to send out the assessment. When the SID gets the payments from the assessment, will be netted out of those costs of collection. I just asked that. Um, also, there's references to payments for seminars for a controller. Do we have a controller? I'm not aware of. If there is an employee that's being designated as the controller, I guess it should be listed on the finance public um, website because there seems to be payments for someone to go to seminars you know, for public um, purchasing and um, being a controller. Also, did we ever close 22 East Willow Court? Because from the bill is you can't tell whether we paid off, made the, the closing and we paid off those monies. Um, as to the historical preservation resolution, you look at the eighth whereas clause, it indicates that there was a public hearing held today. I don't think that's a true statement. And this is the things that courts are looking at to see how honest we are. As to the proposed anti-nepotism ordinance, which is best practices, um, what's the source of the template? Um, why the delay for adopting it? And what advisory committees will be carved out from that um, mm -hmm. coverage? And how do you enforce it? If a citizen sees that there is a appearance of priority or conflict, how do we enforce it? Do we go to the, the VA? I just think that it needs to be clarified. And also a shout out to um, Richie. We were talking about the March of Springfield uh, battle. On your daughter's wedding in Union, one of the churches is holding a uh, historical seminar on that Saturday, Sunday, um, April uh, 8th. That ties in because I think the area is looking into the history of this town. But to just answer those kind of questions, because uh, the bill is because the bill is very important. Thank you. Because because the bill is is what we call the Shami Cooper. <clears throat> Charles Bambara, uh, uh, resident uh, for twenty seven years. Um, uh, in 1872, uh, Stuart Hartshorn had a vision. Uh, it, it was the first planned commuter suburb in the country, and that was Short Hills Village, with the uh, beautiful train station and the surrounding neighborhoods. That is for certain historic. There are other sections of this town that are historic. I'm sad to see that the uh, Nottingham district and, and uh, uh, the adjacent district uh, uh, was removed from the list. I, I think it's a lost opportunity. I think that the people uh, are looking at it the wrong way and perhaps need to be educated. Uh, perhaps there can be some kind of an incentive for residents as being stewards of a historic property to, to offset uh, some of the limitations. Um, but uh, historic properties have a benefit to the town and protection of those historic properties is protecting the heritage of the town. And if done properly, it doesn't have to be limiting to those, to those residents. So uh, sad to see what happened uh, in one section of town. And I'm hoping that the uh, Short Hills Village does pass and the residents are educated and understand the benefits of that. It also protects those properties from other people coming in and tearing it down and putting up some monstrosity of a house that's out of character with the rest of the neighborhood. It, it's not just overdevelopment from, uh, from multiple family units, but it's also uh, inappropriate unfitting architecture that doesn't match the neighborhood that becomes an eyesore. Uh, and that's the way to protect that. I hope that the residents see that as a protection for themselves as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Before I start, I would like to, if you don't mind, just, and I apologize, Council. May I give this to you? Sure. You, okay. I think I got high, so if I didn't, I'm, I apologize. I can send a link, but this is a development guidelines for Summit, New Jersey, the city of Summit. This is just a part of the packet that they have on their e code development regulations. Oh, a necklace. Oh, okay. sorry, I like it. Okay. 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 We'll start. Sorry about that. Okay. So I'm speaking. Let's um, start with your name Christine Best. And I lived in Short Hills and um, 27 years. I should have not said I lived where I lived, but whatever. Um, so I'm speaking, I'm speaking tonight about builders and overdevelopment. And I want to speak right after Charlie because I totally concur with what he speaks about. And I'm very concerned about possible protections that may not be put into place for the Short Hills Village. Um, so this is an important comment. I really believe in what Summit is doing with their development guidelines. And I think they actually have a list of do's and don'ts in architecture and building codes, and it's fabulous. And we should really look to it as a model for our township. So I just want to start off. I'm going to probably read in both of my comment sections. There is a reason why builders shop land in our town. Because we have lax zoning, planning, and engineering codes. Who benefits from builders developing residentially as a home flip? I've come to many conclusions as to why some communities succeed and others fail. After living in MSH for 12 years, I can see the cracks in the facade that is our community. A broken foundation chipped away by special interests of individuals primarily in the development business or that have their own pet project goals as it relates to development. One might question why we have the head of a planning board that has an urban planning background running a village like a city. What are their interests? Is Milburn a personal vision to create into an urban utopia? With the likes of so much egregious downtown development, one must raise an eyebrow. Can a prior mayor who was a real estate broker make those hard decisions about partnering with builders that lack design or community planning initiatives that benefit the continued responsible development of your hometown? Should we consider making such an occupation a disqualifier for, disqualifier for TC committee or any planning committee in the township? Can a local engineering firm that comes up for approvals in front of township employees also be the engineer that works for our town's interests. Conflicts of interest such as this break foundations of our physical beauty and functionality and our town has many. Along with numerous residents, I do not want to see our well-planned municipality fractured. Milburn does not have to accept the type of cookie cutter development that is infiltrating our town and turning it into another suburban faceless place. Let's capitalize on our distinctive assets, the architecture, the history, and natural surroundings rather than adopt a new soulless identity. One of the main reasons townships hold their value is the physical beauty and unique characteristics of the township as well as the unity of the community valuing such things. The school and proximity to work and access to easy transportation are other factors, but not the driving factor. Luckily, Milburn is currently the trifecta on this with a solid school, epic transportation with no parking wait lists and on both stations and beautiful housing stock along with gifted open space. Thank you to you guys. The downtown is another story and seems to be attracting what I call architectural designer and developer parasites. I know there will be a lot of naysayers on this comment and I'm going to finish later. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, Madam Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Township Committee, Administrators, and fellow residents of Milburn. Uh, thank you for giving me time to speak about the open space proposal. Uh, my name is Bill Brazel. Uh, my wife, Victoria, and our three daughters live in Milburn, a, a short block from Taylor Park. Uh, our two older girls walk through the park every day to get to Milburn High and Milburn Middle Schools. Uh, I jog through it early in the morning most weeks, and it's lovely to pass the pond and the open space around it just as I'm waking up. When I'm upset about something, I'll often walk in that park to sort out my thoughts. It doesn't always solve what's vexing me, but I always feel better, more human, uh, after seeing the trees, the moving water, and the other people. And whatever my mood, I can't help smiling when I see a toddler learning to walk on that path. Taylor Park and its playground helped lure us to Milburn from Brooklyn. Many other families have likewise been drawn here by the sight of kids and grown-ups walking, laughing, reading, riding bikes, playing softball and soccer, flying kites. This is a big part of why our property values are so high. More trees, less pavement. 
That's why so many of us gave up cool urban apartments for lawns that need mowing. We wanted our kids to have grass to play on. Our family is lucky to live so close to Taylor Park, and we would like more townspeople to have more public green spaces nearby. I believe most residents feel the same way, that we would like to see more public green spaces rather than fewer, and would be willing to pay a small amount to make that happen. I won't ask you to accept my opinion, of course. I'm asking you to please, let's put this to the public. Let's enable Milburn's voters to tell us what they want. Let's put the open space question on the ballot, please, so we can all decide together whether we would like Milburn to offer its residents more open green spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Armando Vallis. I'm a resident homeowner uh, in Milburn. I'm uh, the gentleman that almost passed away uh, June 30th trying to get through town. Once I got to the hospital, because we had the detour, once I got to the hospital, I had two more heart, heart attacks. Um, prolonging me getting to the hospital just does more damage to your heart. I was actually at the hospital today. Um, I don't know if it's necessary. Anybody have, has anybody seen traffic going through town, down Main Street, trying to get up through Short Hills? or coming down through Short Hills, trying to get through town. Um, I don't know why it's gotta be closed up. You know, it's a direct route to the hospital. Um, have, has anybody considered uh, some kind of option or something to do? So this way people don't have to detour around, around town to get to the hospital. Has anybody talked about it? We'll respond after all the uh, all the uh, comments are done. Oh yeah, you'll respond. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking if somebody talked about it. Like, what can we do to open up town? But anyway, thanks for your thanks for listening. Thank you. On the phone. On the phone. I'm sorry. I'm so. Sure. I'm Al Carlin. I've been a resident for a little more than 30 years. And what this gentleman just spoke about, about dying on his way to the hospital, possibly, uh, he's correct. There is absolutely no reason to close uh, Milburn Avenue. Uh, well, not Milburn Avenue. Main Street. Uh, it's called disaster recovery. Should there be a fire at Lackawanna, uh, Milburn, Bi Milburn Diner goes up in flames uh, during the summertime. How does one get to the hospital? It's called a disaster. Has anyone timed it out? What happens if there is a catastrophe downtown? There's a flood. It rains. All of a sudden, the roads can are closed. How does an emergency vehicle get to the hospital from Springfield, from Union, multiple uh, multiple crash, multiple people are injured. P someone could die. Has anyone done the timing? I used to work disaster recovery. What if worst case scenarios? Have we looked at the worst case scenarios? What happens if the tree falls down? Two different uh, roads get blocked off. There's a fire. What happens? Someone could die. Someone will die. It's up to the town committee to look at these possibilities before they vote on these issues. My opinion. This is what I used to do for a living. Make sure people don't die. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Richie Cyber, resident. So it seems like there's a lot of people in the room here that came to talk about the Main Street closure tonight. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, do I like it? No. You should ask the people in the room here to raise their hands, get a feel from the community, 
how many people would like to see it closed. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Hi, uh, Jean Pasternak. Um, I, I completely support what Bill Rizal just said about the open space, putting that on the ballot for referendum. I think that's the fairest way to assess the community's desire. Um, and I'm really glad to hear that that's being considered. That's a really big step in the right direction. Um, as far as the Main Street closure, I mean, I hear both sides and I think each has a valid point. Uh, there has to be balance and the solution doesn't have to be all or nothing. There are other locations, you can limit times. We can find a way to keep everyone a little unhappy, which means that you've got a good solution, I think. Um, on, the, on the other hand, seeing this gentleman come and speak, I mean, there really is no price on a life. Um, and I think our safety and your protection of us is your paramount job. And so I hope that will be strongly considered in the solution. And um, this is the last time I'm going to ask, but I've asked several times and I'm going to ask again, hoping that it will be answered this time. Uh, will there be a long range planning effort, strategic type planning effort initiated for capital spending for Milburn Township? I don't see how you can assess the approval of projects and all the infrastructure work that's going to have to be done with our fair share housing plan when there's no overall plan. So I'd like to hear from you on that. Thank you. Thank you. So, good evening. Can you hear us? Oh, yes. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't make it in tonight. I would have really rather been there in person. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, the status of the legal proceedings on fair share housing. Um, many, many residents signed the petition to reject the nine Main Street redevelopment of pro project, which is on tonight's agenda for approval um, of repealing the ordinance. Um, I'm one of the many who were and still are concerned about our legal vulnerability, the expense of defending the township, and the potential punitive action the court or fair share housing might take. Um, even someone with a legal background who doesn't specialize in affordable housing would need a tutorial to translate the documents and assess our current position. And I've read the redevelopment agreement and all everything that's been filed that I could read that was on Facebook posted by Fair Share Housing or RPM Township or David Cosgrove. I think all residents, um, those who were and continue to be so stridently against the nine Main Street project and in favor of the Township Committee's decision to withhold the execution of the redevelopers agreement with RPM need and deserve a, uh, a comprehensible update. As far as I can tell from what I've read, and I know this is gonna be overly simplistic, four of our primary defense arguments seem to be asserting that we should have been seen as operating in good faith by virtue of our having committed to or built affordable housing units without being pressured, that maintaining the development of the site um, is now known or maintaining our obligation to redevelop the site is now known to be far more expensive than it was thought to be when it was designated due to the amount of hazmat that we now know is present, uh, demanding the judge should recuse herself due to bias and asserting that we can and will find an alternative site soon for a 75 unit affordable, 100% affordable development. Um, I'd like to suggest that an information session prior to March 28th, I understand now it might be April 8th or 9th, much like the one we have for the Paper Mold Playhouse with a Q and A, a public Q and A session, um, is should be held because I really believe it could avert um, the flare of emotions that results from either not having enough information or having too much misinformation. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else on? To, three, okay. three others. Okay. Can you turn your camera on? There you go. The options before. <laughs> Susan Blackburn, I live in Short Hills and I'm 
I originally called, and I still agree. I mean, I'm in support of uh, designating Short Hills Village a historical area. I'm disappointed that the historical district in Nottingham wasn't uh, properly explained to the people that were objecting, because usually in these places you can it doesn't affect your own house unless your house is historic. But in any event, um, I'm totally a thousand percent in favor of doing it on in the Chatham Road area. And I only wish we could have done it five years ago. The other thing I just wanted to uh, clarify is the 1% of 1 million because 1% of 1 million is $10,000. So we need to be clear that it's 0.01% because our real estate taxes now, I think, are 8%. So we don't want to add and make it 9%. So just uh, putting my two cents of math, since it's only about five days since Pi Day. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mary um, Can you guys hear me? I can hear you, yes. All right, perfect, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, just a little bit louder, I think, if you could just. Okay. Um, hello, everybody, good evening. My name is Anurag Padian, and I'm a resident of Short Hills, and our home is in the Marywood Nottingham district. I've spoken to you before uh, to share mine and our neighbors' opposition to the designation of our district as historic. I'm here today to cover two topics uh, related to the HBC and, and our district. Uh, last week, we received a letter uh, dated March 14th from the chair of HBC, Ms. Canfield, uh, that she'll be proposing a motion during the April 4th HBC meeting uh, to discommend the designation of our district as historic. Uh, I must say I've never heard that word before. And when you hear some words like that, you know you are in policy making now. Um, anyways, uh, this is a, a welcome development. And I know that some of the members of the committee have been uh, speaking to many of us, listening uh, our um, views and HPC is doing that too. Um, but we can, I'm here to reiterate that we continue to oppose that historic designation and we hope that on April 4th, the HPC members will vote to pass the motion to discommend the designation of our district as historic. Uh, second topic, uh, there's a vacancy, I, I believe an alternate um, on the HPC and one of our fellow residents, Mr. Vankatesh, uh, Chitalavada has submitted his interest to be appointed to that uh, open slot. Uh, and I'm here to encourage all of the members of the committee to unanimously vote and appoint Vankatesh to the HPC, just like how you all unanimously um, appointed the other members in, during the reorganization process. That would be amazing. Now, Briefly, I have to change uh, where I was going, but I did hear some of my fellow residents who came before me today who spoke in favor of preserving our township's historical uh, characteristics and save our town from overdevelopment. I want to say that many of us who live in Marywood Nottingham District do not want overdevelopment either. But let's understand that we cannot solve that problem or accomplish those goals by just cherry picking only 153 homes in the entire town and putting them in a historic designation. So that's one comment I would make in response to all of my fellow residents. 
thank you for your time. And ho I hope to be back here after the HPC meeting and celebrate the passage of the discomment. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Can you turn your camera on? Oh, there you go. There we go. Sorry, I'm trying to get it all. Hi. Um, Perry Urso, 514 Milburn Avenue in Short Hills. Um, actually calling um, from Enzo's tonight. As we do not benefit from the Main Street closure, well, perhaps maybe the adverse effect. However, together with my husband as a restaurateur of 30 years, we would much rather be slow than busy at the expense of our valued patrons, families, and friends. Therefore, there is no good time to have a street closure as one cannot predict an emergency. Thank you very much for your time. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Jerry Kung, Short Hills resident. Um, I apologize. I know this has been brought up before, and if it has been produced, um, this, it'd be good to have it public. Have the police department, fire department, and St. Barnabas signed off on the street closure? Um, and if so, can that be made public and shared with the townspeople? Um, I know the Tara you mentioned, is our committee woman purpose you mentioned, uh, there's the two-way Essex proposal going on next week. Um, what's the timeline for this? Is that going to intersect with the proposed Main Street closure? Because if Main Street's closed and Essex is two ways, I don't know how emergency vehicles can navigate. Um, I, if, I, mean, I, I don't know. It just seems like it could be complicated. And if that's going to intersect, then maybe the police department, fire department, and hospital should be made aware of it in case that changes their determination as to whether or not that's a good idea. Um, so just some things to think about. I know there's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, thank you for everything you do and have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, I will now close the public comment period. Would any members of the committee like to respond to any public comments? Committee Moonstoller. Sure, I'll start. <clears throat> All right. Where did the Alex go? Um, <laughs> yeah, we there, there, oh, there it is. <laughs> Good. Um, so the Main Street closure, that's coming. It's going to come up. Um, you know, it's really, we've asked, we've requested studies by fire, police, traffic, and St. Barnabas. So those are the four studies we've requested. They are the experts on emergencies. Without those studies, I'm going to be hard pressed to close anything. Now, all during the heat of the summer and the closure of summer, when you know most of the when the town empties out, we're going to ask police and fire and St. Barnabas and a traffic study to be done and tell us what they feel is appropriate. And they are the resident experts. So we're looking forward for those studies to help us make that decision. And we will do the analytical work. But as I've said time and time before, when a person's life is on the line, a resident's life is on the line, you know, it's very difficult to make a decision. And you never know when an emergency is going to happen. Now, I've been told by many people that we can change lights, the lights and emergency vehicles change everything on the fly. And there's never going to be a backup. Well, I do want to see it. I want to be proven that that can be done so that we are not risking anyone's life. I don't want there to be those, those delays. Um, on the rest of uh, the items here, uh, gas powered leaf blowers. I didn't know we were going to get into that tonight. Uh, that's going to be fun. Um, <laughs> so I'll leave that to Renee and uh, Priya uh, for, for when was the date on that? April 11th. Thursday, April eleventh, seven okay. p.m. Right here. Okay, I'm sure I'm going to be going somewhere for that. Okay, <laughs> April 11th, I'll be. I'll try to be there. Um, uh, Mr. Dwyer had a good point, but I think those numbers. You know, we just have to make sure those numbers work. Uh, but uh, uh, so, 
do we have any flexibility? I want to know if when we get to that discussion on that, do those numbers work? I, don't know you have, I think that is the mechanism that you are able right. to institute. There's no, like, you're not going to be able to get into real estate tra transactions. Okay, good, good. So just understanding that, but it's a good idea. Uh, and then um, I had one other thing here. Oh, and Mr. Feld, uh, you know, on Mr. Canner's retainer, you know, when you use up the retainer, it gets replenished, but I'm sure that is matched up against the bills, but I'll let him discuss that at some point. Uh, I can do it now or I can do it during my response. You can do it during your response. Okay. And then, uh, and if you could answer uh, Ms. Morgan Harris, that'd be great too, uh, during your response. Is that uh, On the uh, legal vulnerability of the arguments for the fair share housing. She was on the uh, Zoom. Uh, and then uh, always good to see Susan Blackburn. I haven't seen her in a while. Uh, all right, very good. That's all I have. Can we get in color? Yeah, it's never easy to follow committee with Stoller. Um, <laughs> but it's true. We haven't, st we've started the process on the, on the main street closure. We've certainly not made any decisions and clearly the emergency services reports and sign offs are are critical to whatever decision that we make. Deputy Mayor. Sure. Um, so with regards to the gas powered leaf blowers, um, I simply brought that up during the reports so that people in the room would be aware that it's something that's being discussed by the EC. At this point, the EC has not even passed a resolution and they haven't made any recommendation to the township committee. Um, I imagine there are a lot of people with a lot of very strong feelings on either side. Um, and uh, I would encourage all of you uh, that have those strong feelings to come to the EC meeting uh, and hear the presentation, ask questions. Um, I know that in my time researching this issue, I've learned a lot uh, and there's still probably a lot more to be learned. Um, so I uh, would definitely encourage you, you know, to get involved now while the EC is still trying to, to figure that out. Um, Mr. Braca, uh, Ms. Valdez, Mr. Valles, I think I'm butchering your last names, I'm sorry. Um, I, I hear you on the street closures. Um, I, I am at this moment adamantly opposed to the street closures for many of the reasons that you guys brought up. Um, I think Mr. Stoller made a good point that, you know, we really shouldn't even be considering another street closure unless we have all of the data. And you know, one thing that I think might be good is maybe we don't close it this year and actually conduct studies over the summer uh, to establish a baseline of traffic patterns and, and see what that looks like. Because just doing theoretical modeling you know, during a different time of the year, I, I don't think that's as good as getting some actual um, you know, firsthand data. Um, you know, people say that the uh, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, I think we had a very close call last year. Um, and, you know, look, if, if these businesses make a few extra bucks over the summer, that's not worth someone's life. Uh, so I would really hope that the rest of the committee members here will think long and hard uh, before they uh, take a position on the, uh, on the main street closures. Um, let's see. Uh, for those of you that expressed disappointment uh, about the Marywood Nottingham designation, um, I hear you. I think that there needs to be a lot more education uh, for town residents uh, with regards to the benefits and you know any potential drawbacks of historic designation. Uh, and I know that's something that I'm working with the HPC on as the liaison. Uh, and um, we are hopefully going to be having some public info sessions soon. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. Um, let's see here. I think that, that covers what I wanted to cover. Can we group groupers? No comments. I'm good, no more stops. The only thing I want to say is um, to, to Mrs. Kirsch, I think we do do a campaign for stepping in the crosswalk, if I'm not mistaken. We've done enforcement in the past. We've done but, that before. But I think um, it's a good ignore. suggestion to We'll put the variable message board up to alert people as to what the penalties are. We've done that in the past as well. Yeah. 
And um, as far as the Main Street closure, I know there's going to be a lot more discussion about this in the coming weeks. And um, it's good to see you, Mr. Velez, and thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Mr. McDonald. Um, yeah, just a few. Uh, I just want to, uh, there's a resolution on tonight for uh, the crosswalks on Wyoming. Um, and it's the township support of the county installing or painting crosswalks. I just want to set some expectation with that. We are listing uh, a number of streets there that we feel are, are uh, reasonable uh, for those crosswalks to be placed. Uh, certainly that will be the county's ultimate decision. And just want to also uh, set expectation that uh, in my conversation with the county engineer, um, the uh, any any curb ramps that need to be redone or replaced will be done will be done when they repave the street. Um, it will not be done when they paint the crosswalks. Those crosswalks are going to be put in as 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 indicated. But um, any construction of curb ramps and 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 that will be done at a at a later time. Just want to set some expectation. Do you, do you have a list of those streets? Uh, they're in the resolution. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um. Just again, and and I know that I don't really need to say this, but I just I do. Um. Uh, with regard to the, the Main Street closure, uh, obviously it is a very difficult decision um, for the Township Committee. It's, it's one of those things that um, that that will take um, some study and understanding. Um, but I just don't. I no one's getting paid off. I think is really what I would like to just say. I don't. I don't. I don't want to uh, have that rhetoric out there. I don't think that's um, fruitful or productive. Um, Mr. Dwyer, I think we answered the question about the mechanism for, um, for the open space, uh, tax. I think that's also why it's being touted as an open space trust fund, um, because, um, that is, um, probably a nomenclature that is better suited for what it, is, it will eventually be. Although the mechanism is, uh, through an assessment, um, that is, uh, that is essentially how it will be housed if it should pass. Uh, it will be in a trust fund with the township. Um, Mr. Fell, to answer your question about <clears throat> the um, comptroller, um, <clears throat> we pride ourselves as a municipality to educate our staff. Uh, those are education classes that somebody is taking. Um, uh, they are not necessarily comptroller classes, but as many of you may know, there's a certification to become a certified uh, municipal finance officer. Those are what those classes are that you're referring to. Um, did uh, uh, and the 22 East Willow will be closed on April 5th? Just to answer that question. And I think that is all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, to answer the question about how my law firm bills uh, the municipality. Um, the retainer isn't money that's being held. The retainer is, our firm is on retainer for the township. Um, we're paid that money monthly to provide the regular services, which is our attending these meetings, fielding calls, uh, doing the regular business, speaking to the committee when they call, the clerk, handling simple OPA requests. Um, that's the minimum bill for the month, and there is no credit uh, towards any other services. The other services we provide are fair share housing, a separate detailed bill is, is given for that. We also bill for complex OPRA matters. Um, and we also have a billable, uh, we also consider it a billable tranche. And that's when we do services that are outside the regular normal course um, and weren't contemplated uh, when we entered into retainer. So those are bills that are provided. And I know Mr. Feld, you OPRA our bills every month and we redact them appropriately and we take the time to do that. So um, you're aware of all our billings. Um, as far as... <laughs> As far as the um, fair share housing consequences, um, I'm not gonna get into litigation strategy. Um, we do know what fair share housing and RPM are proposing as penalties uh, for not passing the RDA. Um, they're seeking uh, daily, daily fines or increasing fines um, of the township that those fines cannot be used from our affordable trust fund. Um, they're seeking the enforcement um, of that of, of a spe specific performance that my, that nine main street should go forward and the court could could issue any orders to allow that to happen um there obviously is legal fees 
associated with it. Um, they're seeking, RPM is seeking its legal fees um, and the township would have to pay their legal fees. Fair share housing is seeking that the township will have to pay their legal fees. Um, so those are all potential consequences um, of the township. Um, we're fighting hard. Those of you who have read the papers, um, I think we've made some good arguments. Um, I think we've made some motions. Um, I do think, you know, there will be, you know, obviously some, there may be some repercussions to the township perhaps, um, but we're doing our best. Um, we think that we think the settlement agreement provides for what we're doing, which is um, providing those units in a substitute form, which I the agreement says. Um, so uh, this committee is working really hard um, in doing that um, and expeditiously. Um, there's really not much more I can say, committee was told, unless you have any specific questions. No, and I just want to offer up that um, on your on your retainer, I speak to Frank and I and Alex and the rest of the committee speak to Jared nonstop. This fair share housing fight literally is like a second, third job for, for us. I'm on the phone with Jared all weekend. My wife's like, who's Jared? <laughs> I'm on the phone with Jared when I'm in Florida for winter break, when I'm in Toronto on work, when he's on, vac when he's on vacation with his kids. So he's literally picking up the phone on a Sunday night or a Saturday morning he picked up the, the phone, I think, uh, when he was on the golf course once. Uh, so, you know, we're in constant contact. So we're literally speaking nonstop. So uh, it really is. It's, uh, it's, it is a hard fight, and the hours are being put in. So, you know, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Are there any comments from the committee in regards to resolution 24-095? I have a motion to approve resolution 24-095. So moved. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Collin? Yes. Ms. Prufus? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacramento? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Thank you. The Township Committee will now consider consent agenda resolutions. Are there any comments from the committee in regards to any items listed on the consent agenda? May I have a motion to approve resolution 24-096 through 24-104, which are listed on the consent agenda? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cullen? Yes. Ms. Prufus? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacamandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stoller, you are scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2665-24. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to present an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 2665-24, Ordinance Amending Chapter 3, Police Regulations of the Code of Township of Milburn to add a new section 3-4 entitled Resident Protection. This ordinance amends and supplements Chapter 3, Police Regulations of the Code of Township of Milburn to add a new Section 3-4 entitled Resident Protection to prohibit trespass for the purpose of committing a crime, including tampering with or committing the theft or unlawful taking of a motor vehicle, breaking and entering, burglary, and home invasion. This ordinate ordinance is an effort by the Township Committee to use its local legislative powers and provide additional tools and resources to the Milburn Police Department as it works to protect our residents from motor vehicle and property crime. The ordinance is intended to allow for the prosecution of acts that violate the ordinance should such crimes not be pursued at the county level or for some other reason are remanded to the local court system. We believe this is a positive step in our continued commitment to explore all avenues and resources available to us as a governing body to make Milburn a less desirable target. I move that this ordinance be taken up and passed on first reading and that the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with law in the item and for hearing and final passage on Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Prupis? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacramandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Committee Woman Prupis, you are scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2666-24. Right, and before we, I read this, we have to make an amendment. So Mr. Cantor, can you just Yeah, so um, 
So there's going to be a, a motion to amend this ordinance. Um, section 2 49 49.3, the last sentence um, reads, um, this policy does not apply to present employees and shall not restrict nor prohibit the continued employment of individuals to a position or positions with the township where a relative of a permanent employee is elected. And it says before, it should say after. So we're gonna move uh, to amend the ordinance to say after the date of the permanent employee start date of the employment with the township. Um, so before- so a motion to change the word before to after. So moved. On. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was saying on this ordinance, but on ordinance number 2666-1. Okay. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. All in favor. We need a roll call. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Collins? Yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacramandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. I would like to present the amended ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 2666-24, an ordinance amending the Township Code of Millburn by amending Chapter 2 entitled Administration by creating new Section 2-49 entitled Nepotism Policy. Uh, Alex, is there anything else you want to say about this? No. Uh, as it was indicated, this is a best practice. We had always had this as a policy in our policy manual. Uh, now we are caught up on it. Great. I move that this ordinance be taken up and passed on first reading and that the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with the law in the item and for hearing a final passage on Tuesday, April 16, 2024. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacramandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. <clears throat> okay, Deputy Mayor Sacramento, you will be sponsoring Ordinance 24-105. Are there any comments from the committee in regards to 24-105? Um, I would like to present an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 2... Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I messed them up. Yeah, I, I was going to be having this. It's a resolution. Uh, yes. I want to yeah. watch out. But uh, can I, you mind if I just interject? Go ahead. Go Sorry. Um, uh, as Mr. Phil had pointed out, um, that lap, that eighth whereas does indicate that a hearing was held tonight. Um, it should be revised that it will be held on April 16th at the second reading of, of the ordinance. Yep. So uh, I make a motion that we uh, amend that resolution uh, and change the date in. The eighth whereas clause uh, to indicate that uh, you know that uh, change the date to April sixteenth, right? Yeah. Yes. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Purpose. Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacramandi. Yes. Mr. Stoller. Yes. Mayor Romano. Yes. Okay, so now we do two four one zero five. Right. Should I explain the resolution? Yes, first, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Right before we get into the yes. ordinance. Um, so what this resolution does um, is uh, refers to the planning board, um, our proposed designation of the Short Hills Village District. Uh, and we're, we have a corresponding ordinance, which we're going to vote on. Um, the Short Hills Village District encompasses the train stations, uh, post office, the um, commercial uh, Tudor style uh, building um, it's to the right of the post office, the Cora Hartshorn Arboretum, uh, and then I think also the, uh, the Silverman uh, property, and then the apartment building behind uh, the Short Hills Village commercial district. Um, I actually reached out to all of the affected landlords, uh, except for Silverman, I didn't have their contact info, uh, talked with them and, and got their buy-in. Um, so, you know, most of this land is township owned, township owned property. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it should hopefully not be contentious. Um, and I think it's very important that we protect, uh, these historic resources. Um, so with that, I guess I'll now introduce the ordinance. Um, I would like to present the board. So now I have, does anyone have any questions or? So may I have a motion to approve resol resolution 24-105? As amended. As amended. 
So moved. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Prugas? Yes. yes. Deputy Mayor Second Mandy? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. <coughs> Okay, Deputy Mayor Second, you are scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2667-24. I would like to present an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 2667-24, Ordinance Designating the Short Hills Village Historic District as a historic district pursuant to the Historic Preservation Ordinance of the Township of Milburn. So just briefly again, this will be the township directly designating the Short Hills Village District as historic. Um, I move that this ordinance be taken up and passed on first reading and that the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with the law and the item and for hearing and final passage on Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Prufus? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacamandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Thank you. Committeeman Cohen, you are scheduled to sponsor ordinance 2668-24. Uh, I would like to present an ordinance entitled ordinance number 2668-24, an ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinance of the township of Milburn, chapter eight parks and recreation areas. The purpose of this ordinance is reestablishing the shade tree advisory <laughs> board and establish the appointment of members by resolution and simple majority vote of the township committee. The township further wishes to establish the general functions of the Shade Tree Advisory Board for reference to future members of the board. Um, basically, the, the, the only change I think in the, in the new ordinance as opposed to what was there before was the previous uh, resolution specified that they met four times a year. Now it says a minimum of four times a year, which was at their request they'd like to meet more often and they that was not part of it and as i said when we talked about this in the new business this changes the appointment process of the members of the board uh, i move that this ordinance be taken up and passed on first reading and that the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with law in the item and for hearing and final passage on tuesday april 16th 2024. may i have a second Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacamandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Mm -hmm. Committee Ms. Stoller, you're scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2660-24. I present for consideration an ordinance entitled Ordinance 2660-24. Bond ordinance to authorize the making of various public improvements in, by, and for the Township of Milburn mm -hmm. and the County of Essex state of new jersey to appropriate the sum of three million five hundred ten thousand dollars to pay the cost thereof to make a down payment to authorize the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation and to provide for the issuance of bond anticipation notes and anticipation of the issuance of such bonds tonight is the time for the public hearing or as advertised in accordance with law i, I declare the hearing open I move that this public hearing be closed, an ordinance be adopted on final reading, and the township clerk be, clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading in accordance with law. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacramandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Committee Man Cohen, you are scheduled to sponsor ordinance 2661-24. I present for consideration an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 2661-24, an ordinance to repeal Chapter 2-33, Shade Tree Advisory Board. Uh, the purpose of this ordinance is to repeal is to repeal Chapter 2-23, Shade Tree Advisory Board from the Township's Code. The Township wishes to reconstitute the Shade Tree Advisory Board. The repeal of Chapter 233 is not to eliminate the Township's Shade Tree Advisory Board, but to add flexibility to the way Milburn Township addresses boards and committees. <laughs> tonight, is the, tonight is the time set for public hearing and final passage as advertised in accordance with law. I declare the hearing open. I move that the public hearing be closed and that the ordinance be adopted on final reading and that the Township Clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading in accordance with law. May I have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. 
Mr. Cohen? Yes. Purpose? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacamandi? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacamandi, you are scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2662-24. I present for consideration an ordinance entitled Ordinance Number 266 2-24, Ordinance of the Township of Milburn, County of Essex, repealing Ordinance Number 2640-23, adopting the Nine Main Street Redevelopment Plan dated June 20th, 2023, in accordance with the Local Redevelopment and Housing Law, NJSA 40A, colon 12A-1, ETSEQ. I'll make up the names. Tonight is the time set for the public hearing and final passage as advertised in accordance with law. I declare the hearing open. Um, Jeffrey Phil, long-term resident. I support the repeal of this uh, the redevelopment plan. However, I think the record should have as part of the record, our planners report that was presented to the planning board when they had to do the not inconsistent uh, review because it sets forth all those reasons. I also urge that that report and the resolution of the planning board be immediately sent to the judge tomorrow as an exhibit because it explains why we acted in good faith. I also think that you should attach the minutes from when it was originally approved when I stood up and I told you it was wrong. <laughs> At some point we had to create the record that this town has acted in good faith, that we got bad advice from prior professionals and we had to retain our, our rights against them. Um, interesting, yesterday, the Wall Street Journal published an article about cost of affordable housing. It seems that when you do 100% that's based on government funding, the cost is about two to 300,000 regular, greater than when you go to um, the private market. Thank you. Thank you. I move that this public hearing be closed and the ordinance be adopted on final reading and that the township clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading in accordance with the law. So oh, May I have a second? Sorry, a second. <laughs> Roll call vote, please. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Purpose? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sacramenti? Yes. Mr. Stoller? Yes. Mayor Romano? Yes. Thank you. So seeing we have no old business and no new business, public comment. Do you want to take All right, sorry. The public comment period is to allow for final comments from the community. When invited to speak to offer your comments, please come to the lectern, clearly state your name and whether you are a Milburn resident and or property or business owner. Please do not provide your full address seeing our meetings are recorded and are readily available to the public. A reminder that in order to help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers shall limit their comments to one three minute session. Judith Christian, Milburn resident. I just wanted to come and express my gratitude for the quick response to my request for uh, crosswalks in Wyoming Avenue. Um, the mayor called me the day after the meeting, and uh, I'm just very happy that the response was that quick and anything that we can do to maintain the uh, pedestrian safety and the community um, nature rather than just having cars speeding through the town, I think is a, a great thing. So I just came to say thank you again. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I just, and my name is Jeffrey Feld, and I reiterate the need for the pleading library and comments, uh, Mr. All due respect, Mr. Fenn, um, on our prior practice when the retainer amount was being paid to Marizini a Falcon, they set forth the amounts that were under the retainer. That's a difference. I'm just saying, uh, just showing the policy procedure. This is the redevelopment handbook. I've shown it to you many a times. The best practice is that we have a separate redevelopment council and a municipal attorney. The reason I said that is that at the last meeting, I said I would offer to follow a certification in supporting us to oppose the monetary sanction motions. I sent it to share with all of you. You're not, the only person I heard from back was Mr. Stoller. 
There are many arguments that we have not made in opposition. I think we had to create a record because this might go up on appeal, such as the original RPM conditional designation. There are no performance deadlines in it. The idea that we waived our right, because this whole case comes back to what happened on July 30th, 2021. Citizens were never given the right to be heard, to know the terms, or to be heard on the final terms before you adopted it, either on January, July 30th or August 17th. That argument has never been made because the idea that we're having here is there should concept, discuss, debate, decide, align. There was no discussion with the public regarding Nine Main Street. And let's not forget about the Woodman project that's on the reservoir that the state's gonna approve. I still offer my certification in the exhibits that they need to be heard. Rams memo needs to be filed immediately. I praise Mr. Cosgrove to writing to the court and explain to how we acted in good faith about the Upton, Wells Fargo. Right now, that's not in the record. There needs to be certifications to make facts. And I'm here to help you with that. Um, also, you need to look at a case that came out today from the United States Supreme Court, FBI versus Perkin. Because it caused about the voluntary secession. Because one of the issues that we I have a fight and we, we disagree with the municipal council is whether we citizens have the fundamental right to be heard prior to action on agenda act action items. I take the position, and I think a lot of other people do, that we had the right and that right was deprived. But in the papers that we're submitting, we never support that argument. And Judge Passamano clearly reserved and just did not decide that issue. And I think that issue should be preserved to defend us against the attacks from Fair Share Housing and RPM. Thank you. Thank you. Charles Van Barren, uh, Short Hills resident for 27 years. Um, I also want to want to point out regarding the uh, the uh, Nine Main Street property. I, I'm a chemical engineer with uh, uh, 54 years of experience, um, and uh, in my business, I design and construct uh, refineries and chemical plants. Uh, I, I know. Uh, contaminated sites and the treatment that needs to be done for them. This township did not have the proper time to evaluate that site for the pollution. We still don't know. And you will never know until you drill a grid of core samples on that site and go down and do GC analysis and other soils analysis and and determine the level of contamination and map the contamination and, and pollutants in that site. We never had the time to do that. So we never could have possibly evaluated that site within the time frame we were given to make a decision. And, and that's another point I think we should raise. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Braca, Melbourne resident. Uh, just one more quick question. Um, the section that I often refer to, Ms. Mayor, uh, is the redhead stepchild of Milburn, is the Washington section. Um, there has been plenty of gas and water um, works done to the streets, which understandably was needed. Um, if you don't have an SUV, it's very hard to drive down any of these streets now because of the patches and the dips and the dunks and the this and the that. So I was just wondering if there was any plan to, once public works is done with the water and the gas and whatever else they need to do, to repave those streets. They, they're, they're honestly, they're terrible. And I have a truck. And it, 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 it's horrible. Um, so that maybe on you, maybe not. I don't know. But I just wanted to express that point that it's all the patchwork has been not 
well done. Mr. McDonald said it earlier, they're all being paid. They are all going to be paid. When they're done. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Christine Best is coming back to finish my earlier statement. Thank you for your time. So going back to what I was talking about, people want to live in an oasis. And if we year by year keep destroying it by making poor development choices in terms of location selected, poor design and material choices, proportion choices, unethical grading approvals, and loosened zoning restrictions, this blight will spread slowly bit by bit, eventually eviscerating the beauty that is this town. Towns such as Summit do not have this problem as they took great action in developing design standard into their codes and you'll rarely see an unsightly piece of architecture in their township or radically graded lot or improperly built out subdivision. MSH was completely on par with Summit in terms of design standards in the early 70s. It is complete, it's completely begin, began to lose its foothold. Summit has an incredible do's and don't list, which I shared with you, with images for builders and architects that cannot understand design aesthetic. They go down to some incredible detail on facade aesthetics, roof design standards, window types, awning styles, overall home proportions, landscape requirements, detailed grading plans, etc. Flat roofs on homes or low pitched roofs are basically outlawed in Summit. We have quite a few of them that were designed by Studio 1200. I guess that's why they don't have a business in Summit. There is an explosion of quite unsightly homes that have these types of aesthetics all over town. Quite a few of them are in Heart Charm Dive. And if you want to get a sense of what I'm talking about, next time you drive up um, the Garden State Parkway, take a look on the right before you hit the I-78 intersection and look at the Whitney Houston rest stop. Such a classy, elegant woman was defamed by such an illicit piece of architecture. So what I wanted to talk about, I'm just going to give you some sort of examples of some concerns. Um, and I probably, well, I won't finish it, but um, one of the, one thing that I wanted to talk about was home at 346 Hobart Avenue that was designed by um, the famous mismatch architect. Well, it just uses their initials TB and peddled to clueless buyers by um, somebody that uh, was involved in real estate and politics. If our town, <laughs> sorry, really trying to be um, discreet. If our town for me, if our township had design standards, poorly designed homes like this, which do not sit harmoniously into the old Short Hills environment would not exist. More importantly, must, one must really look at the ethics of our planning board to understand how a builder can put in his accessory structure patio a foot from the property line and build up the grade of a backyard so much that it now sits above the other properties. And we're talking 10 to 12 feet. Another example that I wanna talk about is a property close to me that had was built a number of years ago with massive steep slope implications that really I don't even think could be regulatory approved. There were 12 to 15 feet. One builder can roll into town, cut a profit for himself, sell the house to somebody, an unknowing homeowner, and then cause distress for up to six homeowners in the vicinity. And that's what I'm trying to talk about. It's very, very concerning. The next time I get a chance to talk, I'll, I'll go into more detail. Thank, and you. thank you so much for thank your time. You. Anyone on? Yeah. Charlie Dwyer, Short Hills. Just one question with Nine Main Street. Now, we, there was preliminary testing that was done and we had recognized there's contamination there it may not be as extensively as it should be. Real question is, what will the town do or what's the town's plan to remediate now that you know it's contaminated? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Perry Urso. I think we need to investigate the last uh, March 14, 2024 SID meeting and the approved closed executive session minutes. I bring you back to a comment stated by my husband in 2020 during the adoption of the expanded five district SID. This organization will have tentacles. Here we are today. The township still chooses to litigate and not mediate. Commercial solid waste has been eliminated without any tax relief. Property owners are taxed without any right to vote. Taxation without proper representation. I requested at the end of 2023 by way of OPRA, all events, dates, times, locations, and attendees from calendar year 2020 to 2023. 
The SID attorney response can be found in the SID agenda February 15, 2024. Based on a submitted email, the response in my opinion is questionable and concerning. Do you find my request to be unreasonable? Clearly seeking that type of data would show how districts are being represented equally. The executive directors a collaboration with the current SID chair, prior mayor, suggesting at the March 14th meeting to expand code enforcement regulatory authority by implementing powers enabling the executive director to make determinations to apply violations and fines, quote, to derelict property owners. This is an egregious reach and totally not within the ordinance, bylaws, and certainly not in the scope of any administrative contracts. As I've stated at the meeting once again tonight, that over the past 30 years, our property deed is not recorded with having a HOA attached to it. It is very scary for a property owner with no voice to be threatened with such policies. In my opinion, implementing a retaliation quote mechanism, which may have a tremendous impact on private property and could be debilitating to one's livelihood. Speaking of contracts, I've asked the question at this last SID meeting regarding expenses listed on their bill list, categorizing as general operating expenses. My question was left unanswered. It is concerning that it seems that there to be nothing be stated within the administrative contact contracts regarding expense accounts and stipends. It is, is it unreasonable to ask such questions? And I would now request that there be proper documentation supporting all charges. Also, according to the closed executive session minutes provided by the SID, executive director has suggested a assessment increase in 2025. Was his recommendation to offset the public statement that 60% of the SID budget goes towards administrative salaries? This recommendation also brings me to the latest Main Street application. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arso. With limited shortened boundaries. Ms. Arso, your time is up. Thank you. I would you. ask the body, the executive director, was he required to say that there is an ongoing lawsuit? Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Is anyone on Zoom? No. Okay, I'm going to close public comment. Would any committee member like to address any comments? Sure. Um, real quick. Um, Ms. Best, I certainly hear um, what you're saying with regards to, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had some design guidelines similar to what Summit has? Um, I guess the question would be for either Jared or Alex, um, is, it, is it legal for us to establish design guidelines similar to what Summit has? And if so, is there an enforcement mechanism or are these... Summit guidelines, just guidelines. That's what I wrote down. Recommendations. Good idea, but are these only guidelines, no teeth? Are they supported by ordinance? So, right. So I look we do some research on that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Ms. Urso, with regards to the SID, um, I, I believe that your, your case uh, is going to be going through some sort of mediation or you know, that's going to be coming up soon. Um, so I'd say let's let's wait and see what happens there um, before we do anything with the SID. Um, and I think Mr. Brock's question was answered. Oh, uh, one final thing. Um, so uh, Mr. Feld has repeatedly requested a pleadings library. Um, can we just put all of the court filings, which you know get circulated on Facebook and elsewhere, somewhere on our website? Is there any reason for us not to do that? McDonald. We've posted, we've posted a bunch of other documents with regards to fair share housing. Is there any reason not to just post the, uh, the pleadings? I mean, I would, I would have to discuss that with, with the, with the conscience attorney. And just get this. I mean, look, I mean, does that apply to everything or is that just applying to fair share housing or is that, you know, every lawsuit that we're involved in or, you know, there, there, there's a lot more questions than, than just sort of stating that and that we do it. Now, but I, think yeah, I, I would agree. I think something to be looked into, and just in in the uh, in the vein of transparency, a central repository of data may be categorized under legal, etc. If it's public, and these are constituents and taxpayers, and 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 you know maybe it is worthwhile to have just public documents, nothing not public, but public documents that are filed. 
central repository of data, you know, may be appropriate. Uh, you know, I, I think if I, I you know, I, I think it would be worthwhile and I would probably desire it if I was sitting in the- uh, I have a question. Queues. Aren't they already up somewhere? I mean, they're public documents. They were filed with the court, so they're available to the public. To so the if you went on the court system under Milburn, whatever, is that how they would come no, up? I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how the public accesses court documents. Um, I've never, I, attorneys obviously have readily accessibility to the to NJ courts. I don't, honestly don't know how the public, yeah, I believe they just, do have access, yeah, yeah. but I don't know. But we, let's, let's look at it. Just yeah, as a, I just don't want to say. Yeah, I understand. No, but let's look at it. It's a certain courtesy as a easy, you know, to, we have a number of great professionals in the community. Uh, you know, you know, Morgan Harris, Susan Blackburn, Feld, you know, David Cosgrove, these guys may want a central repository to make it easy for them to have a central repository of data. Um, they're, they're, they all have they're, 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 they're the ones right, that are right, right. But to, to have it all public, I mean, I, well, for us, it would be I mean, for, for everyone, for everyone. Yeah. To be able to pull it. Um, are you done, Frank? Or? Yeah. Okay. And just to, to, to Frank, uh, to Mr. Fell's point, Jared, um, for the the items he mentioned for a public record for uh, Mr. Cosgrove's letter to the to uh, to uh, the judge, uh, and actually there was a response by RPM uh, to us or. or uh, uh, to the court that it was not allowed. Um, should that be on record as well in, in, term, in the topology memo and the uh, kind of the citizens' rights, et cetera? Uh, you know, I'll defer to you on all that as well, but it kind of makes sense that we would want some of that on record just to make sure there's a record for it uh, for the future. I'll, let, I'll just defer to you on that. Why don't we all think about this and then like come back so uh, I think many of the issues raised uh, by Mr. Feldman and Mr. Cogrove were actually the certification of Alice McDonald, which was already filed with the court. Uh, it lists all the actions taken by Milburn. It lists all the reasons um, why the township did it. So I'd ask that you please reread the certification of Alice McDonald. As far as attaching the planning board's report to the ordinance, it's impossible because the planning board's report has to come after the introduction of the ordinance. And if we were to materially change it, we'd have to reintroduce it, have to go back to the planning board and we'd have to get another report. So what you're saying is actually not no, no, feasible. It's not feasible as well. Um, so what your action tonight? So it's not feasible. It's in the record. We, we, we've seen the resolution. Um, so that, that's my opinion. My opinion is that we made those arguments. The certification of Alex Donald. I agree with the court that um, Non-parties cannot file um, letters with the court. It was filed. I understand Mr. Cosgrove's wants it's, it can't, things can't be unread. So I understand the point of reading it, but I think Mr. Cosgrove understood that it, it will not be considered by the court. However, I'm sure it was read. Just wanted to address this best. You know, uh, you, are, you know, one person's one person's design standards doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean everybody's. And we heard you talking about imposing design standards, and then we heard Mrs. Urso talking about taking over uh, private property. And so those two things are kind of at odds with each other. I will say one way where we do have, or we could have, some imposition of design standards is when we have historic districts. But as you know, there was hardly unanimity in the in the township for that as well. So that's where we are. Mayor, I have one follow up. I'm being advised that the public does have access to NJ courts and can access it. There is a public access to it. So if they went in and put Milburn in, they could find all the documents um, associated. I'm not saying that doesn't mean not have a repository. I'm just stating I wasn't sure if the public could get those documents. I've been advised by my office that the public can get those documents readily on NJ courts. Maybe we could just post instructions on how to do that on the yeah, website, on the and maybe that would be a good compromise. Good. Anyone else? We have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion. We have a second? Second.